All right, guys, so uh, we're covering part two on the doctrine of the post-tribulation free raft rapture, okay? Uh, I didn't want to cover, I, I could have covered this all last week, but I just didn't want it to go on forever. And I just wanted to establish some really important puzzle pieces when it comes to the rapture. Now, the Lord has given us so much scripture, He's given us so much information. As we went through last week, I'm sure you realize just how, how often the Lord brings up the, the sun being darkened and, and the moon going dark and the stars falling from heaven and just pointing us and giving us so much information about that subject, about that time. Okay? And I've got you guys to fill these out. So I was going to tell you to bring them next week, but I forgot. So I just printed them, already printed them out for you um, just so you can continue following today. Because last week, I wasn't really preaching so much about the timing of the rapture. I was preaching more about the events surrounding the rapture, okay? And trying to put that together according to what the Word of God says. You know, what comes first was, as we can see there, was the beginning of sorrows, right? When Jesus Christ speaks of the, of the pestilences and of the wars and the rumors of wars and of the famines, etc. He referred to that time period as the beginning of sorrows. But then he said, after that, then they will deliver you to be killed. All right? And what we read about there in Matthew 24 was there's, there's, there's a time called the abomination of desolation. As you can see down there on your chart, beginning of sorrows and the abomination of desolation. That's in the midst of the final seven years when the Antichrist reveals himself. You remember that? When he uh, um, exalts himself above God and he says that he's the God above all gods. And then that's when... The, the, the persecution of believers takes place. Because prior to that, the wars and the famines, that was affecting the whole world. The whole world was suffering. All right? But then when the abomination of desolation takes place, and we won't have time to go through it today, but this is also when the Antichrist puts in the mark of the beast, and those that want to take the mark can do so if they were to worship the beast and to worship the dragon, and it allows them to buy and sell. Which makes perfect sense as we went through the, through the seals. We noticed that there was going to be famines. We noticed that there was a collapse of currency. You remember that? And so it makes perfect sense that the Antichrist would bring in a financial solution, which would be that mark of the beast. Okay? But uh, believers will not be taking that mark. That The believers will, will be persecuted, will be arrested, will be cured. Um, you know, even if, they, even, if they, even, even if those uh, believers did pass on, they're still going to make it to the rapture later on anyway, because the Lord Jesus Christ will come down with His saints, as we read through 1 Thessalonians 4, and if you notice that, that it's referenced there in that chapter. Uh, but it's a time of great tribulation when the Antichrist persecutes the believers, okay? And still this time is not the time where God pours out His wrath just yet. And then at the end of the great tribulation, Jesus Christ says that uh, in Matthew 24, that the days will be shortened for the elect's sake. Remember that? If you remember that in Matthew 24? Well, the Lord shortens those days of tribulation. And that's when the sun goes dark and the moon turns to blood and the stars fall from heaven. And then that's when we'll be leaving in imminent rapture. At that point, I'll say to you, yeah, the rapture is any moment now. Okay? Because that's when, you know, we see the sign of the Son of Man descend in heaven in the clouds. And he sends his angels to gather the elect uh, from, from, from the earth up to heaven. All right? Now, following that event, when, once the saints are being caught up in the clouds, known as the rapture, or known as the resurrection, the Lord gives us brand new bodies, perfect, immortal, clean, without sin, without sinful nature, and then the Lord will pour out His wrath on the remaining on the earth. Those that have taken the mark of the beast, the armies of the, of the beast, the beast himself, God will pour out His wrath. We don't have time to go through all of that today. But what I want to do, as we were going through this last week, and putting this um, uh, table together, I left, with, I left you with two arrows. Remember that? Uh, the first arrow at the beginning of that chart was the pre-tribulation rapture. Those that believe in the pre-tribulation rapture say, well, the rapture takes place before the beginning of sorrows. Okay? Before the seven years begin. And, and they, they teach that, that you've been raptured at that point. Okay? But our, our church, we believe... That the rapture will take place after the tribulation. That's the second arrow pointing up. But before God pours out His wrath. Okay. So what are the similarities with, with uh, pre-trib and, and post-trib pre-wrath? Well, the first similarity is that we both agree that the Lord uh, God will not pour out His wrath on His people. Okay. That's the first thing. We both agree that God's wrath will not fall upon His people. What we disagree on 
is what the tribulation is. Because the pre-trib believers will lump, will call the entire seven year period the tribulation, meaning that even God's wrath is counted within that, and they state they have no distinct they don't distinguish between tribulation and the wrath of God. Okay? Whereas we do. We see the, the tribulation as persecution from the world, as persecution from the Antichrist against believers. But then when God pours out his wrath, it's it's God doing it against the non-believers. In particular, against the reprobate, wicked ones that have um, uh, worshipped the dragon and the, and the Antichrist. And uh, you know, God ends up destroying the world uh, through that. That's also called the Day of the Lord, if you remember. It was called the Day of the Lord. Okay? So, what I want to do now, I, I didn't really cement the time of the rapture last week. I did talk about it a little bit, uh, but I didn't cement it. So what we want to do, okay? you know, as Bible believers, we believe we have the perfect word of God. Without error. So if there's a contradiction in the Bible, if there's a so-called contradiction in the Bible, who's wrong? Is it God that's wrong? That did he write the contradiction? Or is our understanding wrong? That we've understood it as a contradiction. If we it's us, right? If there's a contradiction, it's us. And so what's what's really awesome about the Bible is that when you get into false doctrine, you know, you believe something false, and we've all believed things that are false, you know, don't, don't get worried if, if you if you believe something that's not quite right. But what's good about the Bible is when, when you line it up, when you measure it against other scriptures, if what you believe is correct, it's going to be perfectly aligned with the Bible. And if you believe something that's incorrect, it's going to stick out really bad. It's, it's, going, to look, it's going to look awful. It's going to be inconsistent. There's going to be errors. And then you'll be like, oh, okay, yeah, what I believe here is wrong. And I've got, to, I've got to fix up that area of what I believe. So what I want to do is test these two positions of the rapture, the pre-tribulation and the post-tribulation pre-wrath in light of other scriptures. Okay, in light of other scriptures. And then when we do that, we'll easily be able to eliminate one of them and, and remain sound on another. Okay, you already know which one that is, what I believe it is, but we'll do that exercise together. So I hope you've all got that now uh, because you'll be needing it as we go through different scriptures. I've got my computer again just to make my life easier. But uh, we read through 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Actually, can I borrow a Bible from somebody? Someone doesn't need it. Yeah. Thanks, Dad. First uh, Thessalonians chapter four. So, First Thessalonians chapter four is by far the most popular chapter on the on the rapture. If you're a pre-trib believer, if you're a post-trib, if you're post uh, post-trib pre-rapture, we all agree that First Thessalonians chapter four is about the rapture. Let's have a look at it again uh, in verses from verses number thirteen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. That's concerning them that have passed away. Those that are believers in Christ that have passed away. That ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Okay, so as believers, when we have loved ones that are in Christ, should we sorrow? Yes, we should sorrow. But should we sorrow as others that have no hope? No. Okay? Of course, it's natural to sorrow when a, when a believer passes away, a loved one. But it's not that our sorrow should be without hope. It's because this chapter tells us we're going to see them again. Okay? And we're going to see them in the clouds. That's what's awesome about Look at verse 14. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Even so them which are asleep in Jesus, will God bring with him. Do you see that? So when the rapture takes place... When the Lord Jesus Christ descends from the clouds, He's going to send the saints, the believers that already passed on with Him. Say, so why is Jesus Christ bringing them with Him? Because it's the time of the resurrection. The graves will be open, and those souls that are with Christ will be reunited with their resurrected bodies. And, and they're going to get it first. Okay? So that's what I'm saying. If, if, you, if you die before the rapture, you're still going to make the rapture. Okay, I've heard, I've heard a lot of people say, man, you know, I really want to make the rapture. I don't want to die before then. It doesn't matter. You're going to make it. And you'll be the first one there anyway. Okay, if you pass on before. Verse 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them or go before them which are asleep. So who gets raptured first? Those that are asleep. Those that have died in Christ. They're going to be resurrected first. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. 
Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. With who? Those that have passed on. Our loved ones that have gone on in Christ. We're going to be with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore comfort one another with these words. What words? The words we've just read. Hey, how are we to comfort one another when a believer in Christ dies? With these words. That we're going to see them again. That the Lord Jesus Christ is going to bring them and then we're going to meet them in the air. Alright? So if, if you've lost a loved one, you know, a relative, a friend that's in Christ, that's saved, and you've sorrowed about that, hey, rejoice because you're going to see them again. Comfort yourself with these words. You know, great promises that we see from the Lord. Now, those that teach a pre-trip rapture, when they read the words, wherefore comfort one another with these words, you know what they read? Comfort one another that you're not going for tribulation. That's what they teach, right? They just ignore the context that he's talking about. And they say, well, we're not going to go through the tribulation. So that's why we're comforting one another. No, that's not what it says. But I wanted to read that to you just to establish that we all agree this is about the rapture. Okay, it's not something that I need to prove once again. Okay, every sort of seasoned believer recognizes that this is about the rapture. But what I do want to bring your attention to, in light of what you have here, I want you to look at this. We're going to continue reading, right? We're going to go to chapter number 5 and continue reading. Now remember when the Bible was written, there weren't chapters and verses, right? I know we get comfortable with chapters, and you might like, you know, if you read one chapter a day, for example, you might just read chapter 4, and then tomorrow you read chapter 5, and you don't, you don't really think about what you read about yesterday, potentially. Okay, but truly, this was written to just follow through, to continue, alright? Let's pick it up from chapter number 5, verse 1. It says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren... Ye have no need that I write unto you. So if you were reading chapter 5 by itself, your, your first question would be, well, what times and seasons are you talking about? Well, of course, the context there is in chapter 4. The times and the seasons of the resurrection, of being caught up in the clouds. Verse number 2. Now, as we read verse number 2, I want you to look at your chart. Okay. Now remember, we put this together, together, like together, right? Everyone is following through, we're going through many scriptures, black and white scriptures, Saying what follows, what's before, then this, then that, and we put it together nicely. Okay? It's, it's not complicated. Right? And you've got all the references there if you need to go back to it. But we're going to now eliminate one of these rapture right now. Okay? When we look at verse number 2. Let's look at verse number 2. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Now look at your chart. Where's the day of the Lord? If you if you got there, it's, it's in box 5B, right? The day of the Lord. That's the day of God's wrath. So hold on. We're just finishing talking about the rapture here. The times and the seasons of the rapture. Verse number 2. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. So what are we talking about? We're talk which one lines up? Are we going to be raptured before the beginning of sorrows? Which is long before the day of the Lord? Or are we going to be caught up in the clouds... At the day of the Lord. You know? What did verse number 2 say? The day of the Lord. Verse number 3. For when they... This is when the non-believer... For when they shall say peace and safety... Then sudden destruction cometh upon them. Hey! Those that are not going to be raptured... What's going to happen to them? God's going to pour out His wrath. Sudden destruction will come upon them. The non-believer. Okay? As travail upon a woman with child... And they shall not escape... But ye brethren, you brethren, you brethren that are believers, are not in darkness. That that day, what day? The day of the Lord, we just read it, should not overtake you as a thief. Ye are all children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Now, I've asked a pre-tribulation pastor once. Where does the Bible teach that the rapture can happen at any moment? You know what verse he gave me? There, in verse number, uh, verse number 2. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as the thief in the night. And they say, see, when the thief comes in the night, you don't know when it's going to happen. They just come and break into your house. You had no idea they were going to be there. Because if you knew, you would have prepared for the thief, they would say. Right? But hold on. Remember verse number 4. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. 
So when Christ comes, is he coming as a thief to us, believers? No. We're not of the darkness. We're of the light. Okay? He's coming as a thief to the night to the non-believers. So it's a very unusual thing for a believer to say, well, he's coming as a thief in the night. So, well, you're numbering yourself with the non-believers then. That's just, it's crazy. Why would you do that? You do that because you've got a theology, you've got a doctrine, you're trying to support with scriptures, but it doesn't remain consistent with what we read in the Bible. Okay? So we know that the Lord will come on the day of the Lord. Hey, the day that we're raptured is called the day of Christ. That's a positive mention. The day of Christ, the gathering together in the clouds. We'll look at this later on. But it's also known as the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord, as we saw last week, is the day of God's wrath. The same day that we're caught up into the clouds is the same day that the Lord will pour out His wrath upon the earth. Okay, so there's this double, double meaning there. But notice then, which rapture position is consistent? Obviously, it's the post-tribulation, pre-wrath rapture, because we're raptured there at the beginning of the day of the Lord. Okay, lines up perfectly with 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So all we're doing, guys, is going through some end time passages, and we're just seeing which position of the rapture is consistent, which position lines up in the Bible, and which position is inconsistent, okay? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Hey, it's, right, it's Paul writing to the same church, right? He's already written about the rapture. 2 Thessalonians, he writes about the rapture again in chapter number 2. He says, verse number 1, But we beseech you, brethren, by the, what? the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto Him. Hey, what is the coming of the Lord and the gathering together unto Him? Is that not the rapture? Of course it is, right? We're reading 2 Thessalonians. It's an epistle written to the New Testament church. Hey, this is for us. This is for us to own it and pay attention to. He says, we beseech you. Pay attention, please, he's saying. Verse number 2. Now, we're going to read this slowly. Verse number 2. That ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us. Let's stop there for a minute. I want you to pay attention, brethren, that you won't be troubled, you won't be uh, shaken in mind, right? What, what, in what, in regards to what? As that the day of Christ is at hand. Hey, what does it mean to be at hand? If I said to you, you know, let's say we're expecting someone else to come tonight, we'll say, you know, such and such person is at hand. What am I saying? They're very close. They're, they're about to turn up, right? It's imminent. They can come at any moment, kind of thing. Hey, who's teaching that? Who's teaching that the coming of Christ can be at any moment? It's the pre-tribulation teachers, right? And Paul says, don't be, this, don't be shaken or troubled as that the day of Christ is at hand. <laughs> you know, it, it's such an unusual thing that we're warned about this. And yet today, and look, please, it's, it's only been the last hundred years. I know in your minds, if you've gone to church since you've been born, I know in your minds you're thinking, but everyone believes in the pre-trib rapture. How can they be wrong? Well, it's only been around for 100 years. And if you're, if you're younger than 100 years, you've, that's all you heard your whole life. Okay? But prior to that, everyone else believed in the post-trib rapture. Okay? You find this in the writings of many people. And, uh, but anyway, it's, 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 the, it's um, the deception. We look at this. Look at verse number 3. Let no man deceive you by any means. Hey, there's a deception when it comes to the coming of Christ. And I'm telling you that deception for us in modern day Christianity came a hundred years ago. Alright? Look at this. For that day. What day did we just read about? The day of Christ. What's the day of Christ? Verse number one was the gathering together unto Him. Right? It's the day of the rapture. For that day, the day of the rapture, shall not come except... They come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now, the son of perdition means the son of damnation. Alright? Now, who is this son of perdition? Who is this man of sin? Look at verse number 4. It says, Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, 
showing himself that he is God. If you were here last week, verse number 4 should ring a bell to you. When does this take place? When is the man of sin revealed? When does he exalt himself above God? Remember, it was called the abomination of desolation. It was in the midst of the week. It was in the middle of the week. Remember that? The book of Daniel spells that out very clearly. Both pre-tribulational and post-tribulational believers agree on this thing. That when the Antichrist reveals himself, exalts himself above God, it's in the middle of the week. We both agree on that. Okay? So, let's, let's put it back together again. Verse number 3. Let's go there again. Verse number 3. Let no man deceive you by any means for that day. What day? The rapture shall not come except they come a falling away first. We won't talk about that right now, but it's, it's more likely apostasy, uh, turning away from the truth of God's word. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So let's look at our, our rapture uh, graph here. Which one then, if the day of Christ, if the rapture cannot come till the man of sin is revealed, which one then is consistent and which one is contradictive to the scriptures? Obviously, the pre-trib rapture is inconsistent because the man of sin, the abomination of desolation, comes after the pre-trib rapture. But this passage says that the day of the rapture will not come until the man of sin is revealed. So the man of sin, the, the ab abomination of desolation, must come before the rapture. So, strike two. Strike two for the pre-trib rapture. All right? And we see that the post-trib pre-rapture -rap is aligned perfectly with the scriptures. Okay, I don't need to twist the scriptures. We just read them as it is, and it's aligned perfectly. It's, it's, it's consistent with the Bible. All right? Strike two. Let's try another passage. Let's go to Matthew 24. Let's go to Matthew 24. Matthew 24. And uh, we already kind of read this last week, but I just want to cover it again because it is a very uh, prominent passage when it comes to the end times. But Matthew 24, verse 29. Matthew 24, verse 29. Now, I will say this about Matthew 24. The pre-tribulational believers do not believe this passage is about the rapture. Okay? That, that, that's not, so so if, I, if I'm covering this passage, they're going to be like, oh, well, of course that lines up with your teaching because this is not even about the rapture. That's how they'll see it. And they'll believe that this is, the, this is a passage for the non-believing Jews. Okay? Now, let's debunk that very quickly. Okay? There's a few ways to debunk that. But look at uh, verse number 3. Matthew 24, verse 3. Matthew 24, verse 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? So one way to debunk it very quickly, guys, is what, what are the disciples asking about? What it shall be the sign of what? Thy coming. Right? Thy coming. Now, we already read, you don't need to turn there, we already read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, but I just want to read to you one more passage here. Verse 15. For this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. So, when Paul talks about the coming of the Lord, what does the disciples ask in Matthew 24? What shall be the sign of thy coming? Okay, so we know immediately that the coming of the Lord in Matthew 24 is the same coming that's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Okay, unless there's multiple comings of the Lord. All right, but there's, there's, the, the, there's the rapture here. It's, it's, it's given the same name, and 1 Thessalonians is written to the New Testament church. It's not written to the non believing Jew. Okay, that's point number one. Okay, that should be an easy one. But point number two who's asking this question to Jesus Christ? Is it non believing Jews? No, it says the disciples came unto him privately. Hey, what are the disciples? It's, in fact, these men became the apostles. They, they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. They're saved. They make up the New Testament church. You know, these are the, these are the leaders, like Peter, he was a pastor. These were, the, these were the leaders of the New Testament church. Okay? And our doctrine is built upon their writings that we have in Scripture. Alright? So... Quite often what I hear from certain uh, pre-trip teachers, they say, well, Matthew 24 is not for us. It's for the unbelieving Jews. Well, hold on. Who's Jesus speaking to then? They say, he's speaking to the Jews. Well, no, he's speaking to his disciples. Hey, and and they're, the, they're the leaders of the New Testament church. So who's he writing to? And okay, not only that, 
But uh, we won't go there. But those that are asking, guys, are the apostles. Are the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. And notice, because he responds to them, I'll just take an example here. Look at verse number 9, Matthew 24, verse 9. Then shall they, this is the abomination of the desolation. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. So who is Jesus responding to, to the disciples? Who is he saying? To you, he says. To you, my disciples. You're the ones that are going to be delivered and killed for my name's sake. The non-believing Jews don't even believe in the name of Jesus Christ. Okay? So this doesn't line up at all with that kind of teaching. All right? But anyway, let me give you another way to debunk this. Look at verse number, uh, sorry, verse number 29. Verse number 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. Now, if you look at your chart, if you take your chart, guys, you look at it, that is the sixth seal, right? We saw that in the book of Revelation. This takes place in the sixth seal. I've called it the celestial darkening, right? And, and the pre tree believers will say, hold on. This is when Christ comes and establishes himself, you know, uh, feet on the ground and starts his millennial kingdom. They'll say, this is when it takes place. They, they read Matthew 24 and they say, this is when it takes place. But when we compare it to the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation says this is the sixth seal. All right, the sixth seal. We haven't even gone through the trumpets. We haven't gone through the vials. And I think one of the vials is the, the curse or the, or the, the, um, the, um, ah, the, the, the locusts that come out of the bottomless pits. And the Bible says that they're tormenting men for five months. This is before Revelation 19 when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back on a horse, riding on a horse and establishes his kingdom. So this is not even the end of the seven years. This is just the end of the earth as we know it. Because straight after this, this is when God pours out his wrath and starts you know, shaking things up significantly. All right. So that's another way to prove it, guys, is that this is not the end. I mean, if you compare this, let's look at it again in verse 29. I'm oh, sorry, verse 30. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall the tribe of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and glory. Hey, what's he coming in? He's coming in the clouds. When we looked at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and Revelation chapter 1 verse 7, which was your memory verse, we saw that the Lord is coming in the clouds. But what about Revelation 19? They say this is about Revelation 19. In Revelation 19, he's coming on a white horse. Okay, he's coming on a white horse. So this lines up with 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 more than it does with uh, Revelation 19, which is the coming second, uh, when the Lord establishes his kingdom on the earth. Okay, and I mean, there's more than that. He shall send his angels. So there's angels with the great sound of a trumpet. There's trumpets. They shall gather together his elect. There's a gathering from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So they're caught up into the heaven, they're caught up into the clouds. All right, that all lines up with what we read in First Thessalonians chapter four, unless you're just willingly blind, and unless you're just willingly wanting to reject this doctrine. All right, now what I did want to cover, though, oh yeah, that is what I, that is what I wanted to cover is that this is not the end of the seven years, okay? But it is the uh, the still the wrath of God to come. So when we look at our charts, we saw how it correlates with the Book of Revelation. Which uh, passage is that? Referred to. If this was the end of the seven years, then God's wrath would have already occurred. Okay, but if it's up, if God's wrath is after the post tree pre wrath rapture, which it is, then this makes perfect sense because once God called, calls up His saints, then God pours out His wrath. That lines up perfectly with uh, seal number six of the book of Revelation because following that, the Lord then uh, unleashes the seven trumpets and the seven vials of His wrath. And I know I've not covered that. That, in, that. Those things need its own sermon, but you can do your own study in your own time when it comes to that. Okay? So Matthew 24, 29 lines up perfectly with the rapture taking place after the tribulation, but before God pours out His wrath, also known as the Day of the Lord. Alright, let's go to another passage. Let's go to Revelation chapter 6 now. I spoke about Revelation chapter 6. Let's get a bit more uh, context here. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. And we're just going to look at the passage there, which talks about the sun and moon being darkened in verse number 7. Uh, Revelation chapter 6, verse, actually verse 12. Revelation chapter 6, verse 12. And I beheld, and he opened the sixth seal. 
And lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as the fig tree cast of her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll. So the heavens, the, the sky opens up like a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island will move out of their places. And the kings of the earth, look at what they're doing. The kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, look, what are they saying? Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne. Look at this. And from the wrath of the Lamb. Look at this. Verse 17. For the great day of his wrath is come. And who shall be able to stand? Hey, what comes after the sun and the moon being darkened? The, the day of the wrath of the Lamb. Okay? The Lord Jesus Christ is now going to pour out his wrath upon these great and mighty men. And they, they hide in, in their bunkers or they hide in the mountains trying to flee from the wrath of God to come. Let's look at verse number 7. Verse number 7. Uh, sorry, chapter number 7 I should say. Chapter number 7. We'll keep reading. And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth holding the four winds of the earth that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor any tree. Actually, we'll skip a few bits down here. Let's go to verse number 9, because we've got a lot to read here. Let's just drop down to verse number 9. All right. So we saw the sun and moon being darkened, right? In Revelation chapter 6. According to Matthew 24, that's when the Lord raptures His believers. That's when we're caught up in the clouds, and those that remain are going to face the wrath of God. Okay. So if we go to verse number 9, what do we see? After this, I beheld... And lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palms in their hands. And by the way, guys, just so you know, this is us. We're reading about us. Okay, you are all numbered in this great multitude that uh, is being seen in heaven. Verse number 10. And cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth on the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders of the four beasts and fell down before the throne on their faces and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honour and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? So an angel says to John as he's writing this, in, you know, trying to write down the revelation, trying to write down what he's seeing. The angel says, who are these people? Right? It says, uh, how did he say it? From whence? Sorry, what verse was that? I lost it. Verse, verse 13. Yeah, and whence came they? Wait, what's that word whence? It means from where, right? Do you guys know the word thence? From there? From, and whence is from where? There's another one. Hence, from here. Okay, the word whence is from where? So where did these people come from? Verse 14, and I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. He goes, I don't know, you know. <laughs> Why are you asking me? And I'm trying to write these things down. And it says, uh, Thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation. Look at your chart. The sun and moon went dark. These people are in heaven. Where are they taken from? If you look at your chart, before the sun and moon being darkened, it's the great tribulation. And the Bible's consistent. The Bible's perfect, right? We don't need to mess around with the Bible. It tells us itself. They came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. Now, this is very important. Verse 17, I want you to remember this for later on. Verse 17. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters. Now, this is the next bit. Pay attention. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. So once this multitude comes out of the great tribulation, they praise God in the throne. They've come out of great tribulation. 
And then God says, look, they're not going to hunger anymore. They're not going to thirst anymore. They're not going to get hot. Like, I'm hot right now, sweating. It's not going to happen. But then the Lord's going to wipe away all our tears. All the sorrow, all the sadness, all, all the you know, uh, sorrow that we've had on this earth. God's going to wipe it all away. That's important. I want you to remember that, okay? That straight after this rapture, straight after the court in heaven, their tears are wiped. Very, very important. It's often overlooked, okay? But I just want you to pick up there, guys, that after the sun and moon were darkened, it was the great day of the Lord's wrath. We see this multitude in heaven. Where do they come from? The great tribulation. Being caught up of all nations, of all tongues, of all people, okay? all kinds of people. Now look at the church here. We're, we're all from all nations. We're, we're from different places. You know, it's going to be like us times millions, you know, billions of believers that were living throughout the ages that are caught up before the throne of God. And so what we see here in, in our Revelation chapter 6, and then when we align that up with Matthew 24, is the perfect consistency. The tribulation, the sun and moon go dark. For those that are on the earth, bad news for them. They're going to face God's wrath. But then we see people caught up in heaven came out of great tribulation, and God shall wipe away all their tears. Okay? Now, there are those that are the holds of the pre-trib rapture. They're going to say to you, no, 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 this group that we just read about, that's not you. That's the tribulation saints. I just want you to remember that. Is this the New Testament believers like us? Or is this another group called the tribulation saints? We'll have a look at, the, at that at the moment. And that's what I wanted you to remember. Remember the tears being wiped away. That, that's very uh, crucial for later on. All right, let's look at uh, another passage now. Let's go to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. Uh, you know what? I might skip this passage because it's going to take me a while to explain. I'll skip that. And maybe I can talk to you guys about that some other time. But first, let's go to 1 Corinthians. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The passage that we're going to read, guys, is the second most popular passage on the rapture. Again, just like 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, everyone agrees it's about the rapture. Well, 1 Thessalonians 15, everyone agrees it's about the rapture. You don't, you don't need to argue that point with anybody. You can just turn people... You know, if you're having a debate with them, having a discussion, you can just turn them here and show them some other interesting passages, okay? But let's look at verse 51. 1 Thessalonians 15, verse 51. The Bible says... Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Now, we already know this, all right? What does it mean to sleep in Jesus? To have passed on, to, to die, but you're a believer. God considers you sleeping, like your, your physical body is asleep. But we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of the eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound. Hey, what's this about? The trumpet sounding. And the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Now, if you go and ask, again, a pre-trip believer, you say, where else does the Bible talk about an imminent rapture? The rapture can happen at any moment. They'll take you here. Verse 52. They won't read verse 51. Just, just uh, not, ignore verse 51. Just read 52, which says, uh, In a moment, in the twinkling of the eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound. So what's a twinkling of the eye? It's basically, it's like the speed of light. It's when light reflects off your eye. That's the twinkling of the eye. Okay? And they'll say, well, see how fast the rapture is. It can happen at any moment, and it, it's so fast, and that's why they call it the secret rapture. You know, we'll be, we'll be here, and like, in the speed of light, in the twinkling of an eye, um, we're going to be caught up in heaven, and the rest of the earth is not going to know what's going on. Hey, what did the Bible say? That the, the, these men are going to mourn and wail when they see him. And we saw the rich men, the captains, hiding in the mountains. You know, asking the, the rocks to, to save them from the day of the wrath. Hey, they're going to see Christ come in the clouds as well. It's not a secret rapture. He blows a trumpet out of all things. That's pretty, it's going to be pretty awesome. A trumpet from heaven, the shout of an archangel. All right, Everything else is dark. The sun has gone dark. The moon has gone dark. And you think people aren't going to see Jesus Christ come in? Of course they are. Okay, The heavens are going to be rolled back as a scroll. It said in Revelation chapter 6. I'm not sure what that's going to look like. The heavens are going to open up. Right? And somehow eternity was going to pass through that. We're going to see Jesus Christ come and descend. Hey, this is going to be an amazing scene. And if you've seen those Left Behind movies or other movies like that, how do they picture it? Just a bunch of clothes left behind and people just disappeared. Like twinkling of an eye, they say. Okay, let's, let's answer that. Look at verse 51 again. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, 
but we shall all be changed. Right? Uh, in See, comma? It hasn't finished. We shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. So what happens in the twinkling of an eye? The whole rapture event, Jesus Christ coming, catching the believers, the shout of the archangel. Is that all happening in the twinkling of an eye? No. Our physical bodies shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Hey, these bodies, these, these uh, sin-natured bodies with sin, with disease and sicknesses and all the lust of the flesh and the pride of life and the lust of the eyes, all of that's going to be gone in the twinkling of an eye. Praise God. And we're going to just, whoa, whoa, we've got a new body now. We have these resurrected bodies and the power of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, which are without sin. That's going to happen in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. But not being caught up in the clouds. Not the Lord coming back and blowing a trumpet. All of that's going to... I would expect that would take as long as you would consider, just sort of put it in your mind, think, think about how that would sound and look. It's probably going to take, you know, maybe a minute or so. <laughs> it's not something that happens in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. So that's how you answer that, uh, that uh, verse that people bring before you. But I want to notice, let's keep reading, look, look at verse 53. For this corruptible man, sorry, for this corruptible, this physical body, must put on incorruption. Hey, God's going to give us an incorruptible body. And this mortal, what does it mean to be mortal? It means you can die, okay? For this mortal must put on immortality. Hey, God's going to give us bodies that cannot die. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of the sin is the law. But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now let me say something to you. Most people, and I'm not saying I'm great. Look, I'm, I'm not, honestly, I don't think I'm a great teacher. I don't think I'm a great preacher. But the one thing that I do is appreciate the surrounding verses when you read something, right? And so when we look at verse 54, 55, 56, it says, look at, look at it again, uh, halfway through verse 54. Then shall be brought to pass the same. So when we get these new bodies, then the same will be brought to pass. Say, so what is the same? Well, it's a saying, it's a writing from the Old Testament. It's actually something that's found in the book of Isaiah. So please, go to the book of Isaiah, if you, if you can get there pretty quickly. Keep your finger there in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and go to the book of Isaiah. We can't ignore, when the Bible says, this is written there, we should go back and have a look at where it's written, so we can get a big picture of what's going on. Isaiah chapter 25, Isaiah 25, Isaiah 25, Isaiah 25, verse 8, Isaiah 25. Now, if this doesn't convince you that Revelation chapter 7 is for the believers, for New Testament believers like us, I don't know what's going to convince you. Because when I found this out, and I, I did not hear anyone preach it, I came to, to realize this on my own. I was like floored. I was like, man, the Bible is truly amazing and truly consistent, you know. Uh, but before we read it, let, let's, let's set this up, right? Everyone agrees 1 Thessalonians 15 is the rapture for the New Testament church. Everyone agrees to that. What we don't agree with our preacher brethren is uh, Revelation chapter 7. We say that's about us. They say, no, that's not about us. Okay, and that's what I said to you. Remember the wiping of tears. Okay, now, verse 15, uh, 1 Corinthians 15 said, as it is written, when we get the resurrected bodies, it's, it's what is written about the, uh, the death is swallowed up in victory. Now, look at Isaiah 25, verse 8. Isaiah 25, verse 8. This is where it's written. He will swallow up death in victory. See where it's written? Isaiah 25 verse 8. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces. And the rebuke of his people shall be taken away from off all the earth. For the Lord hath spoken it. I mean, if that doesn't blow your mind, I don't know. <laughs> right? Revelation. Uh, lining up with Matthew 24. Revelation chapter, uh, chapter 6. Revelation chapter 7. Lining up with Isaiah 25 verse 8, which is then spoken of in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Alright? Which everyone says, yeah, that's about us. 
Well, then accept it, right? Revelation 7 is us. It's when the Lord gives us our resurrected body and wipes away all our tears. Okay? Now, if that doesn't convince you enough, Isaiah chapter 25. Now, I don't know if you believe this or not. I do believe, I, I believe this uh, myself, but does anyone know how many books, sorry, how many chapters are in the book of Isaiah? Do you know? 66. 66 books, exactly. There are six, sorry, chapters. There are 66 chapters in the book of Isaiah. And how many books of the Bible are there in the Bible? 66 books of the Bible, okay? Now, most people, if you've read your Bible a few times, you're going to realize some really strange things. You're going to notice that, you know, Isaiah chapter 1 is a lot like Genesis. Isaiah chapter 2 is a lot like Exodus. You're going to see Isaiah 66 is a lot like Revelation, all right? And it's lined up, you know, very consistently with uh, the Bible. Now, we just read from Isaiah chapter 25. So what book of the Bible would that line up with? Um, if you've got your Bible, go, go, to, go to the table of contents. Go, go to the table of contents so you can get all the books of the Bible in order. I want you to figure out, I'm not going to tell you, someone can look at it. Look up the 25th book. So Isaiah chapter 25. Okay, Isaiah chapter 25 should be lining up with the 25th book of the Bible. The 25th book. When you, when you find it, just put your hand up, let me know what you find. The 25th book of the Bible. Yeah. It's the book of Lamentations. Do you guys know what Lamentations means? It means weeping. It means crying. It means sorrow. Alright? And what did, what did we just read about? The Lord's going to wipe away that tears from our eyes. It's gonna, we're not going to sorrow anymore. Okay? Now let's look at this. Go, if you go, I don't know, if you're interested, if you can do this. Otherwise, just listen in. Go to Lamentations chapter 1 verse 1. 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 The Bible says, How doth the city sit solitary that was full of people? How is she become as a widow? She that was great among the nations and princess among the provinces. How is she become tributary? Verse 2. She weepeth sore in the night. And her tears are on the cheek, on her cheeks. Among all her lovers, she have none to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They have become her enemies. Now, if we take this symbolically, okay, and we take this about the nation of Israel, okay, yes, Old Testament, but we take it about the Israel of God in the New Testament, which is all believers. That's that needs its own sermon. We won't go to that right now. We just take that. We're talking about people that have dealt with her treacherously. If we're talking about the end times here, and we talk about believers going through a time of difficulty, of trial, of tribulation, right? Where, where people are treating believers uh, uh, treacherously, as it says, then yeah, I would expect there to be a lot of weeping during that time. A lot of crying, a lot of sorrow, a lot of crying out to the Lord, asking for help. Now, go to Lamentations chapter 3. Go to chapter 3, verse 25. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 25. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 25. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 25. It says, The Lord is good unto them that wait for Him. Hey, what are we instructed to do in Thessalonians, in Matthew 24? To wait for the coming of the Lord. To watch for His, uh, for his coming. Okay, notice this in, in uh, Lamentations 3, 25. The Lord is good unto them that wait for Him. To the soul that seeketh Him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. Hey, when it comes to the salvation of the soul, do we have to wait for that? No. You know, we put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Then we're born of the Spirit as soon as we do that. And we receive salvation of the soul immediately, don't we? It's not something we have to wait for. We're saved. But there is a salvation... A completion to that salvation that we are waiting for. Hey, that's the salvation of our physical bodies. When the Lord gives us those resurrected bodies, and that's when we caught up to the Lord, and He wipes away all our tears. I mean, the Bible is just amazing. I don't know how deep this stuff goes, but when I found out, hold on, Lamentations, that's the weeping book, and then oh, how, how do we rejoice? How do we glory? What gives us glory when we wait for the salvation of the Lord? It's obviously physical salvation there. And we see how this all ties in perfectly with what we saw in Isaiah 25. The wiping away of the tears. Revelation chapter 7. The believers that were saved in tribulation. 
uh, and had the tears wiped away. But then Isaiah 25 pointed back to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which everyone says it's about us. So why reject all these other passages? You know, when the Lord gives us this information, I don't need to make it up. It's all there. Right? It's all there and it's perfectly consistent. So, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 51 and to 54, what we just read. Everyone says it's about us. It's all about the rapture. Is it consistent with the pre-trib rapture? Or is it consistent with a post-trib pre-rapture? Well, if you remember, uh, 1 Corinthians 15 spoke about death being swallowed up in victory, which points us to Isaiah 25, which talks about that being the time when the Lord wipes away our tears. In the book of Revelation, when does the Lord wipe away our tears? In Revelation chapter 7. Who are the people that are in Revelation chapter 7? Those that came out of great tribulation. So what does that mean? The rapture, the resurrection is after the great tribulation. I hope that didn't go over your head. I hope that made that sort of easy enough to understand. But I just want to show you, this is what I wanted to cement with you guys. Yes, we, we put this together last week. But I just want to show you that when we look at these two positions and we compare it now with the rest of the scriptures, you know, some significant passages about the end time, that the post trip pre rap lines up perfectly and the pre trip rapture falls apart. I mean, look, say, Kevin, why did you change from pre trip to post trip You know, for a long time I've wanted to be a pastor. For a long time, I was thinking about it, you know, I didn't really do anything about it, just something that was in, in the back of my mind, or tell my wife about it. You know, Christina wasn't really on board for a while, I was like, oh, well, no rush, you know, <laughs> I'll wait for her to turn around. Uh, but then, you know, obviously, you want to make sure when you become a pastor, you're, you're well-versed in doctrine, you know the Bible well enough. You know, you don't need to know, know it all, nobody knows the whole Bible, but, you, you know, you want to know a good portion of it so you can teach it. Uh, but the pre-trib rapture was always a doctrine that I could not teach. Like, if you came to me and said, like, I believed it. Because that's what everyone believed. But if you came and asked me, Kevin, where is it in the Bible? I wouldn't be able to show you. I mean, and look, and you ask any pre-trip pastor or preacher and say, can you show me where it says that the rapture is before the tribulation? There are no verses. Okay? And if they're honest enough, they're going to admit it to you. Okay? I had two pastors once. One admitted to it. The other one didn't want to admit to it. Okay? It just depends how honest and how truthful they want to be. It, okay? Now, that caused me a lot of problems because I believe in the deity of Christ. That's a fundamental doctrine. But I can, I can prove the deity of Christ very easily with a number of passages. I believe in the virgin birth of Christ, another very fundamental doctrine. Hey, I can show you that a virgin conceived. You know? I, can, I can show you that in just black and white scriptures. I don't need to dance around that. I can just show you the scriptures. You can read it. You can see that's what the Bible says. You know, I believe in the Trinity. I believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Again, I can show you multiple passages about that in the Bible, right? About the Trinity. I believe that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh, 100% God and 100% man. I've covered that, I've already preached that. We can go through all those things. I believe that salvation is by grace through faith without works. Again, I can just open my Bible and show you, you know, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for example. You know, I, I can just turn to any, part, any one of these fundamental doctrines that people stand on firmly, right? And... Uh, and I can open those passages and show you. Just I don't have to explain it to you. I can just show you. you know? And then when it comes to a so-called fundamental doctrine on the coming of Christ, yeah, everybody can show that the Christ, Christ is coming back. But where does it say it's coming before the tribulation? And so if I was going to teach that, if I would have done it against my conscience. I would have done it against, like, I'd be afraid before the Lord because I don't have scriptures on it. Hey, and all the churches that I've come from have always said, don't believe the preacher. You know, always, whatever you hear, go back to the Word of God, go back to the Scriptures, be like those of, um, sorry? Berea. Berea. I was going to say Thessalonica. <laughs> the Bereans, be like the Bereans and go back to the Scriptures and search them daily to see if those things are so. But when it comes to the preacher of rapture, no, no, don't do that. Here's a book. Read this book. Here's a video. Watch this video. Here's a documentary. Watch this. Right? And I've done courses, Bible college courses, not a Bible college, but in my church, covering these topics. And I got good marks because I know how to copy and just retain information and just spew it out. All right? But that's one thing. Anybody can do that. Any, any robot, any computer, you can program a computer to spew out. No, computers are garbage in, garbage out machines. Whatever you put in them will come out. Okay? Any, any preacher can do that. Okay? But what, should we be that as believers? Should we just be computers that just garbage in, garbage out? 
No. We're believers. If it's garbage in, well, let me test it with the Word of God. That's garbage. I'm not going to repeat that information. I'm going to go and find out what the Bible says and make sure that we stand true on the Word of God. Now, let me say this. Um, the pre-trip doctrine, the, the, the rapture, the coming of the Lord, is a very uh, emotional doctrine. Okay? It's, it's close to the hearts of a lot of believers. You know, Pre-trip, post-trip, all alike. And uh, you'll find, if you haven't already, that people get angry, people get upset when you don't believe in the preacher rapture. Now, you might take it personally. You might be like, why do they hate me? Well, maybe they hate me, but I would say more than likely, it's, it's just a doctrine they've got close to their hearts. They're looking forward to Christ. So are we. We want to be with the Lord forever. So do we. We want to have those resurrected bodies so we don't sin before the Lord again. So do we. We all want that. Okay? And so when you take a position that's contrary to them, it's not something that's sort of intellectual for them. It's very emotional. You touch a few raw nerves and they'll get upset. They'll get angry, you know, and they might fire back. Look, but don't take it personally, all right? I have con I've shown many people what I've shown you guys and I've convinced many of them. And for some of them, it's taken years because it is an emotional doctrine. It's something you're trying to hold on to very strongly, right? And after I showed it to some people, it wasn't even, it wasn't even my, my preaching that convinced them. It was going back and listening to the pre-trip teachers afterwards and coming back saying, yeah, they've got no scriptures. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, I, I'm left with nothing else. Like all the dominoes have fallen down. I'm only left with the post-trip pre-rap rapture. So my point is this, guys. Please be gentle with other believers that are our brethren. I don't believe this is something worth dividing over. Now, if there are people saying Christ is not coming back, that's a major issue. That's a major heresy. That's something worth dividing over, okay? But because our doctrine is only about three and a half years difference, it's really not worth being argumentative, being difficult about. And as I said, I think last week as well, is if this does happen in our lifetime, if this does happen in our lifetime, then you're important. You're very important to other believers because they're not going to know what's going on. They're not going to understand why has the Antichrist revealed himself? Why is this persecution coming to the church and to the believers wasn't Christ meant to come before the tribulation? That's where you're going to have to step in and say, well, hold on, let me show you what the Bible says. And get their hearts and minds prepared for the coming of the Lord. So how do we, how do, we do this? Do we run away? Do we, do we run in, in fear? No. That's our last chance to go out with the gospel. The gospel of the kingdom. And preach it wherever we go. You know, if we run from city to city, it's to preach the gospel. If we go from nation to nation, you know, I've got a dual citizenship now. I can go to Chile. Or if it gets really bad here, I can go to Chile. Or if it gets really bad in Chile, I can come here. But wherever I go, it's to go and preach the gospel. Wherever the gospel is ready to be received, that's our goal. It's not to hide. It's to do the, the last works, to earn those last rewards, so that when Christ comes back, hopefully he says, you know, they are good and faithful servant. That's, that's really what we want, right? Okay, let's pray.